Coming up on Fresh Dew with Pastor Inkechi Ene. The Church of Jesus Christ has partnered with Satan in ignorance and religion to assassinate the character of God. God's character, God's nature has been assassinated and his children have held the gun. God's nature and God's character have, has been assassinated and the church has fired the bullets to assassinate the character of God. Coming up on Fresh Dew with Pastor Inkechi Ene. We are going to Benin City. Fresh Dew is going to Benin City. Hello, Benin City. The host of Fresh Dew TV, Pastor Inkechi Ene, will be live in your city. It will be two days of Fresh Dew Faith Feast, holding on Friday, 3rd, and Saturday, 4th June. 2022 at the Uyi Grand Marquis Event Center, number 9 Agayu Bini Street, off Adesua Grammar School Road, off Sapele Road, Benin City. We've been on TV non stop from April 4th, 1998. You can rejoice about it. Meeting scheduled Friday, 3rd June, 5 p.m., Fresh Dew Live. Saturday, 4th June, 9 a.m., Healing School. 4 p.m., Identity School. 5 p.m., Fresh Dew Live. Benin City, get ready for fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Visit www.freshdew.tv to reserve your seat and get updates. Hello and welcome to Fresh Dew. I am Pastor Nkechi Ene, and it's always my pleasure to welcome you to every single episode of Fresh Dew. Fresh Dew is a program designed just for you. It's designed to build you up and give you fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Today on Fresh Dew, we continue our message series, The Healing Miracles of Jesus. And we are now on miracle number six, this is part three of miracle number six, the healing of the two blind men. Miracle number one was the healing of the leper. Miracle number two was the healing of the centurion's servant. Miracle number three was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Miracle number four was the healing of the paralytic. And miracle number five was the deliverance of the demoniac. And we are on miracle number six, which is the healing of two blind men. Our text has been from Matthew 9, 27 to 31. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. The first thought we've been dealing with is you must be expectant. We said if you're going to receive your healing, you must be expectant, child of God. You want to be expectant. The power of expectation is so important to your receiving your healing. And we saw that these blind men, by their actions, they were expectant. Then we began to say this, that your expectation is based on two main sources, what you heard and what you know. And we saw that the blind men had these two sources at work in them, what they had heard and what they knew, what they had heard and what they knew. So let's go on to something else now. Apart from your expectation being based on two sources, another thing about expectation which is also seen in the story of these two blind men, is your expectation must be persistent. 
Your expectation must be persistent. What does that word persistent mean? Persistent means continuing firmly or obstinately in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition, continuing to exist or occur over a prolonged period. That's what it means to be persistent. Now, I'm not talking about being persistent in the wrong thing, but you're persistent in your expectation of faith. You expect, you're, you're persistent based on what you know about God and what you've heard about him, about Jesus. You're persistent. You continue firmly despite the opposition and difficulty that comes your way. Looking again at the story of the blind men, let's look at it very well now. And let's see the persistence in their story. Matthew 9, 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. Now remember, think about this. They were blind. They could not see. They were following someone they could not see. And we said they did that based on what they had heard and what they knew. Now they didn't just follow him and stop after a while. He says they followed him, crying out, verse 28, when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe I'm able to do this and so on? Let's read that from the Living Bible. Now listen to this. When Jesus was leaving her home, that's Jairus' daughter, the two blind men followed along behind, shouting, O son of King David, have mercy on us. Verse 28, they went right into the house where he was staying. And Jesus asked them, do you believe I can make you see? And so on and so forth. They followed him and went right into the house. Let's really think about this. Now, these were two blind men following Jesus. I'd like to think Jesus knew that they were following him. We've seen Jesus heal people along the road. The woman with the issue of blood got healed in the crowd. So Jesus could have stopped, turned around, and healed them if he wanted to, or asked them, why are you bothering me? Why are you following me? Jesus kept going, and they kept following. We're safe to say that they could pretty much have felt that Jesus was ignoring them. Jesus was aware they were, they were following him, like I'm sure of that. They followed him, two blind men, all the way to the house he was going to. Jesus knew they were following. He ignored them. And they kept going. Such was their persistence. They kept, we have no idea how long that journey was. We're not told how long the journey, but it was, must have been quite a trip. And he, they went from Jairus' house to the house where Jesus was staying, probably Peter's house, wherever he was staying, and they followed him. He, he, they didn't stop on the road. Jesus didn't stop and pay attention to them. They followed him all the way to the house. Now wait for this. They got to the house. We can assume that Jesus got to the house because he was welcome there. He probably had a room there or he was invited there by whoever owned the house. These guys were not invited. They didn't stop at the door and wait to be asked in. The Bible says they went right into the house. They followed him till they got him to get their attention or get his attention. They followed him right into the house. Such was their persistence. How persistent are you, child of God, in your expectation? Do you give up along the road, along the dusty road? Or do you give up when you get to the door of the house? They could have stopped at the door of the house. And the owner of the house, no, 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 it's Jesus we're expecting. Who are these people? Shoo, shoo, go away. Two blind men, what are you doing here? The Bible says they followed Jesus right into the house. That's how persistent they were. You know, I remember a story, I remember a young man who he and his wife were, they'd been in church for a while and they were, they were trusting God for so children. I didn't know them. I didn't know, or didn't know of them. And one day the, the, the young man decided he'd had enough and he invited himself to my office. Now, normally you want to see the pastor, you come in, you fill a form and you wait for your appointment. Well, this young man came, filled his form and said he wanted to see pastor. And normally the front desk officer would have told him, well, you submit your form and you wait to be told when you're going to, you're going to get an appointment with pastor. But you know, I cannot believe the force of his expectation probably made her do what she should not have done by virtue of her job description. With the power of the Holy Spirit and the force of his expectation, this front desk officer brought his form right up to me in my office and said, there's a young man that wants to see you, pastor, and he says he needs to see you. I mean, everybody comes and fills the form and wants to see me, but normally they would go through the process. But she, she came upstairs and gave me the form. I believe it was the force of his expectation. And again, I believe that same force of his expectation 
which has happened from time to time, by the Holy Spirit, I looked at the form. There was nothing spectacular in the form. I just said, you know what, is he still here? She said, well, he just stepped out and is beginning to leave. I said, go, go and call him. In the middle of the afternoon, on a day I was doing something else. Such was his expectation. He invited himself. He literally gets crashed himself into the office, got himself an appointment by the Holy Spirit. And I said, come in, come in and see me. And he came in and sat down. I said, Pastor, I, I, we need help. We're just done with this. And long story short, they received their, their testimony. They had a lovely baby boy from that encounter and so on and so forth. My boy, he called his wife to come meet him in the office. The story is this. He invited himself. These people invited themselves, not into Jesus' house, but the house where Jesus was staying. Such was their persistence. They were not going to let go of their expectation. Child of God, are you that kind of person? Are you the one who gives up along the way? Or are you persistent in your faith and persistent in your expectation? Remember the story of the Syrophoenician woman, the woman who you know, came to Jesus and, and um, said her daughter was in a, in a horrible state. Let me read that from the Philip's translation. Then Jesus left that place, Matthew 15, 21 to 25. Another person who was persistent. Just to give you a picture of what it means to be persistent, what in your, in your expectation and persistent, too many of us give up along the way. At the slightest difficulty, at the slightest opposition. Look at this woman. Jesus left that place and retired into the city, into the Tyre and Sidon, Sidon district. There a Canaanite woman from those parts came to him, crying at the top of her voice, Lord, have pity on me. My daughter is in a terrible state. A devil has got into her. Jesus made no answer. Again, he ignored. The disciples came up to him and said, do send her away. She's still following us and calling out. In other words, they were saying, she's irritating us. This is one of the miracles we'll look at later. But she's, she's bothering us. She's following us. Send her away. I was, only, I was only sent, replied Jesus, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then the woman came. She didn't go away. She persisted and knelt at his feet. Lord, help me, she said. That's another picture of persistency. Glory be to God. You must be persistent. Your expectation must be persistent if you receive your miracle. She refused to let go of Jesus until she received the healing she expected for her daughter. The two blind men followed Jesus right into the house and refused to be intimidated by the fact that they were uninvited. They couldn't even see, but they went all the way through. How many of us gave up on the slightest difficulty, I ask again? We shouldn't be like that. Let's look at some truths that will help you hold fast and remain persistent in your expectation. First of all, persistence, and we'll look at this one today. Persistence is anchored very important, in what you know of God's nature. Persistence is anchored. Persistence in your expectation, child of God. What are you expecting to receive from God today? What healing are you expecting? What miracle are you expecting? Are you expecting conception? Are you expecting a healing in that condition in your body? Are you expecting a healing for your child? Are you expecting a healing for your mother? Somebody is expecting a healing for their mother. What are you expecting? It is anchored in what you know about God's nature. Who do you know God as? What do you know God to be? Who do you know he is? It is anchored in what you know about God's nature. Hebrews 11:6. without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. From the Philip's translation, I love this, listen. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. The man who approaches God must have faith in two things. First, that God exists. And secondly, that it is worth a man's while to try to find God. You become persistent because you know it is worth your while to pursue after God. You become persistent because you know it is worth your while to stand and believe that you've received that healing. You become persistent because you know who God is. 
you believe that he is who he says he is. You know, let, let, me, let me make this statement. The church has partnered with Satan to assassinate the character of God. The church of Jesus Christ has partnered with Satan in ignorance and religion to assassinate the character of God. God's character, God's nature has been assassinated and his children have held the gun. God's nature and God's character have, has been assassinated and the church has fired the bullets to assassinate the character of God. So many people, many believers give up on their expectation, give up on their belief, give up on their work of faith after a while because they really are not sure who God is. We must settle today what we know about the nature of God. We must ask ourselves some very basic questions about who God is. The, the year I'm preaching this for the first time is 2022 here on Fresh Dew. This is April 2022. In April 2022, there are still believers who are not sure of who God is. There are still believers who cannot testify and beat their chest and say they know that God is a good God and he's always a good God, regardless of the circumstances they experience. Once you have uncertainty in the nature of God, you will not believe that it is worth your while trying to find God. Therefore, it will be impossible for you to walk in faith. It will be impossible for you to be persistent in your expectation, and it will be impossible for you to please God. You've got to be settled about the nature of God. We must restore the character of God in our hearts. God himself has not changed. God is who he says he's always been, but his character has been assassinated. He's been given a bad rap, a bad reputation, and the church has partnered with Satan to do this. And the underlying effect is when the children of God don't know who he is, they cannot therefore discern what is from him and what is not from him, and they cannot receive from him. So therefore, they cannot be persistent. Why would you be persistent to receive from someone you're not sure of? It doesn't work. So let's begin today to settle a few things about the nature of God. And we, we've got to know just these very simple, very simple things. We settle them. Your persistence is anchored in what you know of God's nature. First of all, child of God, do you know that God is good in his nature? You say, ah, Pastor Ngechi, that's God. Don't, don't, don't be in a hurry to say that's common knowledge to everybody. It's not. Do you know God is good in his nature? First Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, period. He is good, period. The plane fell out of the sky. He is good. You lost a loved one. He is good. Something happened you couldn't explain. He is good. You weren't expecting that sickness to hit your body. He is good. There are no conditions here. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Psalm 1968, you are good and you do good. He is good and he does good. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. And look at Psalm 27, 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. That's the expectation we're talking about. I would have given up. I wouldn't have been persistent in my expectation. I wouldn't have held fast to my confession of faith, except I was confident that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Friends, God is good. We chant it, God is good all the time. But when things happen, we find ourselves not quite sure anymore. God is a good God. If it is his nature to be good, he says you are good and you do good. It means regardless of the circumstances, God is good. You've got to get to a point where you can say that. You say, oh, Pastor, this is very basic. Ah, it's very important. We settle some basic things afresh. Because when, when storms hit us, when things happen, you'd be surprised that seasoned believers begin to doubt the very nature of God. Satan is on, on, on rampage. And sadly, he's using the pulpits to assassinate the character of God. Because the minute you're not sure, you begin to create a God that soothes you 
in the situation you can't explain. In doing that, you try to change the nature of who God is. But he that comes to God must believe that God is who he says he is. That's the only way you can please him, by faith. Glory be to God. So do you know that God is good? Second thing, do you know that he is sovereign and that his sovereignty reflects his goodness? You see the, you see the balance? Do you know he's sovereign, first of all? Let's look at that. Let's, let's start with that one first. Do you know that God is sovereign? What does it mean to be sovereign? It means to possessing supreme or ultimate power of a nation or its affairs, acting or done independently without outside interference. That's what sovereign means. 1 Timothy 6.15. Let's look at some scriptures. Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. That describes the sovereign God. Let's read that from the Phillips translation. This will be in his own time. The final denouement of God, who is the blessed controller of all things. Look at that controller, that's the sovereign God. Of all things, the king over all kings and master of all masters. Look at Job 37, 7 from the Amplified. God seals up, stops, brings to a standstill by severe weather, the hand of every man. And now under his seal, their hands are forced to inactivity that all men he has made may know his doings, his sovereign power and their subjection to it. Oh, this is a God who is in control of everything. And many of us as believers use this knowledge of the sovereignty of God to begin to arrogate to God things that God did not do. Things happen, we say, well, God is sovereign. Oh, he wiped out this planet, he's sovereign. He wiped out this entire building, was for his glory. He killed this person because he wanted them in heaven to see. And we say all kinds of things. Well, let's begin to look at the third thing now. We've established that God is good and that God is sovereign. Well, do you know without a shadow of doubt that God's sovereignty only reflects his goodness? If a king has a particular nature, this is the nature of the king. If the king is going to be sovereign and do what he wants, doesn't even, it even make sense that the only thing he will reflect is what he's got within him? Well, if God is good and he does good, and that is what his nature is, and he's also sovereign, then he will reflect his goodness in his sovereignty. This is one thing we must settle if we're going to have persistent expectation, regardless of the difficulty or opposition. When you say God gave you a cancer to train you, or you say God gave you a sickness to get your attention, then you're saying that God is a house divided. And let's see what Jesus said about that. Look at Luke eleven sixteen to 20. Others testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against the house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, Jesus speaking, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. What Jesus is basically saying here, God is not a house that is divided. So when you say God heals sometimes, and he kills sometimes, when you say God healed someone of cancer, but in his sovereignty, he chose to give cancer to somebody and kill them, then you're saying he's a house divided. And Jesus says, no, a house divided will fall. But if you say, I use the finger of God to cast out Satan, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Glory be to God. God is sovereign, but he uses his sovereignty just for his goodness and his goodness alone. These are things you must settle about the nature of God. If you're going to be persistent in your expectation, if you're going to believe God and stand, you're going to remember that John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Then don't, don't arrogate stealing, killing, and destroying 
to Jesus and don't arrogate life to the enemy. Different. God is a good God all the time. He's good and he does good, but he's also sovereign. At times he does just what he wants, but just what he wants is good. His sovereignty will always reflect his will. And like we said last episode, it is his will to heal all diseases from all people all the time. That is the will of God. And when he wants to wield his sovereignty, he will use it to effect that good thing, that good will, which is to heal you, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation, regardless of the sin you committed that caused that sickness. In his mercy, he will heal you of all the diseases all the time. That is who God is. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. We see clearly who you are. We will no longer pull the trigger and assassinate your character. We'll see who you are. Because when we can believe that you are who you say you are, then we can believe you and stand persistent in our expectation. Get crashed through the house if necessary. Invite ourselves in. Break the schedule like the Syrophoenician woman. But we come right in because we know you're a good God. And you will always give attention to those who believe you and have faith in you. Thank you, Father, for your word. We give you praise. Are you alive but not really living life? Do you know somewhere deep down that something needs to change in the course of your life? Does it feel like you have lost your way in life? Yet to others, you seem to know your way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Can you believe that somewhere on the inside of you? Do you believe it? He is the answer to every question. And he loves you just the way you are. Today, he's waiting for you with arms open wide. And he wants you just the way you are. Surrender your life to him and run into those outstretched arms. If you want to do that, say this prayer out loud, meaning it from the depth of your heart, and you will be saved. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I believe you are the Son of God, and that you died for me and rose again just to save me. Come into my heart and make me brand new as you have promised. I will live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Congratulations on taking the most important decision of your life. You are now born again and a brand new person. It has all happened on the inside of you. Now you need to grow in your new faith. And what has happened on the inside will surely be reflected in your everyday life. We can help you grow in your new faith. Please call us at 0700 Fresh Dew or email us at saved at freshdew.tv and we'll be here for you.